Hi, this is uh, Luis Sezi. I'm a co-founder and CEO at OctoML and a professor of computer science at the University of Washington. And you're listening to Disco Posse podcast. Perfect. All right. You've okay. done this before. You're <laughs> okay. Um, cool. All right. So should I tell a little bit about uh, my story and, the, and how the company got formed, which is all intertwined? Yeah. Great. That's the beauty part. Cool. So, uh, Luis, awesome. uh, so, this is fantastic. I, I, I do want to very quickly introduce you as your company is doing some really neat stuff. And of course, I've, I, I say this as a, as a precursor to what you're going to tell us. But for the people that are listening, we hear ML, AI, and it becomes like this wash that it's assumed that it's like, you know, they always, they, no one believes what's actually going on. I've dug in and I'm excited about what you and the team are doing. Uh, so I, I wanted to lay this up. This is, you have really are solving a very genuine and interesting challenge. And I can't wait to kind of figure out how you got to solve these problems. Um, so anyways, Luis, take it away. Let's, let's introduce you to the audience and, and talk about where, where you're from and, and how you got to begin the OctoML story. That sounds good. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I have a technical background. So most of my, you know, I guess, uh, intellectually active life has been uh, in um, computer architecture, programming languages and compilers. You know, I have uh, my PhD was at the University of Illinois. I spent time at IBM Research before then working on, you know, large scale supercomputers uh, like Blue Gene, you know, uh, primarily applied to life sciences problems. Uh, and at the University of Washington, where I've been almost for 14 years now, it's kind of crazy to think about. Um, my research um, career there has been focused on what we call, you know, the intersection of new applications, new kinds of hardware, and, you know, everything in between, you know, compilers, programming languages, and, and so on. And about uh, five or six years ago or so, we started looking at the problem of, um, well, the opportunity, I would say, uh, that, you know, based on the observation that machine learning is getting popular super fast, right? Because, you know, machine learning allows us to solve interesting problems for things that we don't know how to write direct code for. Like, for example, if you think about how you're gonna write an algorithm to find cats in a photograph, it's really hard to, to write the direct code for that. But, you know, it turns out machine learning allows us to infer a program, learn a model from data and examples, right? So this proof has proven to be really powerful and machine learning is permeating of every single uh, application we use today, right? So, but anyway, so six years or so ago, we started thinking about, well, there's a variety of machine learning models that people care about for computer vision, natural language processing, you know, other time series predictions and so on. And um, a variety of harder targets that you want to run these models to. This includes CPUs, GPUs, GPUs and then yeah. accelerators and FPGAs and DSPs and all sorts of compute engines that have been growing really fast. So you have this interesting cross product of you have lots of models and lots of hardware and how do you actually get them to run well where you need them to run? That includes the cloud, the edge, you know, implantable devices, you know, smart cameras, all of these things, right? So. Um, and one thing that's interesting to note in this context about machine learning uh, models as computer programs is that they're very sensitive to performance and they're very, you know, compute hungry, they're memory hungry, they're bandwidth hungry, so they need lots of data, they need lots of compute. Um, therefore, making them perform the way you want them to perform to be able to run fast enough and or use, you know, um, a, a reasonable amount of energy when being executed requires quite a bit of tuning your performance, right? So uh, that means that if you look at um, the way machine learning models are deployed today, they're highly dependent on hardware vendor specific software stacks like NVIDIA with right. their GPUs has CUDA and then CUDA, the CUDA stack. You know, ARM has ComputeLib, Intel has MKL DNN, you know, uh, and then a, a, a software, the, the hardware vendors have their own software stack in general. So uh, this is also not ideal because then that means that from uh, somebody who wants to deploy machine learning models, they need to understand ahead of time where they're going to deploy, how they're going to deploy, and use some custom tools that typically are, aren't uh, super easy to use. And there might not even be a software stack for the hardware that you care about that works well, right? So long story short, the research that we started at the University of Washington six years ago was to try and create a common layer that maps you know, the high level frameworks that people use, think of either what the data scientists use like TensorFlow, PyTorch and so on, or NumPy. 
and uh, bridge that to a uh, hybrid targets in an automatic way. So you don't have to worry about how you're gonna deploy it. Create this clean, uh, open, uniform layer that automates the process of getting your models from data scientists to production. Well, this seems sound like, yeah, it seems like a good idea and you know, people would agree, but there's a lot of challenges there, right? Because uh, the way machine learning models are deployed today, they rely on hand-tuned low-level optimizations of code. That really means like understanding the model, understanding the hardware and tuning the low-level codes to make sure that you make the most out of that hardware, right? So it takes a tremendous amount of work that's not sustainable. So the research question that we uh, started exploring was, can we use machine learning to optimize that process? Okay, so essentially use machine learning to make machine learning faster on your chosen hardware. And that's what, that was the, that was how the uh, Tensor Virtual Machine project was born. So we started this project six years ago, five, six years ago, and fast forward to today, it's a top level Apache foundation, software foundation project called Apache TVM. It's been adopted uh, by all of the major players in AI ML, including the uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, and so on. It's supported by all of the major hardware vendors. It is actually the de facto open uh, standard for deploying models on a bunch of hardware targets that is open source, right? So, um, so ARM, for example, um, adopted TVM as their official software stack. So AMD is building with with OctoML, um, you know, support for AMD CPUs and GPUs uh, on uh, on Apache TVM, and then other companies like Xilinx, uh, which makes FPGAs, and a bunch of other right. you know nascent hardware companies are using Apache TVM as their preferred software stack. And just one final sentence, and I know I know this has been going long, but I just thought I'll give oh, you the no, overall no, it's all story. Good. There's, so, there's no there's no rapid way like this. This is a super important understanding of how we got to even the start line, which is even before where we are today, right? Right, yeah. So um, anyways, and then um, TVM has been um, adopted both by end users and, um, and hardware vendors. And the way to think about TVM in one sentence essentially is this compiler plus one time system to form this common layer across all sorts of hardware. And think of it as a 21st century operating system for machine learning models that runs in all different hardware, right? So um, that's Apache TVM. It has almost 500 contributors from all over the world. Uh, it's been adopted, as I said, by all the major players in the industry. And we formed OctoML about a year and a half ago to uh, continue investing in TVM. All of the core people around uh, Apache TVM are co-founders of the company. So these are three PhDs from the University of Washington, uh, and you know um, another co-founder, Jason Knight, who was head of AI software products at Intel, left Intel at that time to join the company. So OctoML today has about forty people. Uh, we uh, our mission is to build this machine learning acceleration platform to enable anyone. Uh, that in a very automatic way to get the models deployed in the hardware that they want without having to fiddle or with you know different software stacks or having to tune low level code to deploy your model. Really, we are about automation and democratizing access to efficient machine learning because the tools today require quite a bit of rare, rare skills. So, yeah, and I think that's where we really want to begin is that every you know abstractions are generally done because it allows for obviously diversity of platforms above and below the line, wherever that abstraction layer is. So the appropriate mm -hmm. abstraction is a fantastic place where a platform begins. Then even further up is how do you organize a, a commercial entity that can create an additional value even beyond mm -hmm. that is a, is really amazing because, you know, especially in a niche area like this, where you look at, look at the folks that are contributing to TVM and to who are obviously well down the road, you know, people are thinking that ML is coming. Like it's already here in, in, in a broad it's sense. Everywhere. But so beyond the abstraction, now there's that optimization, which makes it, you know, we'll talk about the Octo ML approach to it. Maybe give a sense of, what does a non-optimized machine learning model do relative to an optimized one? Because I think this is, it's yeah. hard for people that uh, don't get it great. to understand this yeah, great. scale. I love that question, Eric. Yeah, so uh, 
So the unoptimized version typically means that you have a, you get a machine learning model and you run it through say TensorFlow default deployment model or PyTorch and you choose say, a CPU or a GPU. Um, and uh, most of the time, what you get is not deployment ready because it's not fast enough or uses too much memory or doesn't make the most out of the hardware and so on. Or you don't get the throughput that you want or if you deploy it in the cloud it's too expensive because it uses a whole, whole lot of compute. So now if you run that through TVM and um, just what TVM will do is it gets that model and then generates an executable that's tuned for that specific hardware target that, you, that you're gonna deploy. It in. So it essentially regenerates custom code. It uses its machine learning magic that we can get into if you want, but basically to find the best way of compiling your model into your hardware targets uh, to make the most out of your hardware resources. And the performance gains can be anywhere from two, three X all the way to 30, 40 X, right? So we have, so if you look at our conference, for example, uh, we had a conference in December for the past three years. Uh, there are cases of folks showing that there were uh, up to 108, not a uh, up to 85x better performance. And right. when we talk about anything above 10x, it's not a nice to have, it's an enabler. Like if you make something five, 10x better, you enable something that wasn't possible before because it's just too slow or too costly. Right. right? And that's the level of performance gain that uh, we're talking about here. So, and this can translate into enabling a model that before was too slow to deploy. Now you can deploy it. That reduces costs in the cloud because 10x faster means 10x cheaper to run in the cloud and so on, right? Well, this, it also helps to answer the myth, I would believe, that there is a hardware-specific machine learning unit. It, while there are obviously hardware-specific iterations, <clears throat> each model, each data set based on scale, size, use, you know, there's a lot of factors that even the most perfectly designed physical unit with a you know broad set of GPUs, whatever it's going to be, or whatever the right combination of things, may not be appropriate for every model, right? So this is it's exactly far beyond. Right. This is not like there's like a really good gaming laptop and a really good you know machine learning is at any. It doesn't take long before you get to the scale of using machine learning before even a machine learning node is not optimized for yeah. your particular model. Absolutely, yeah. So another way of saying that too is that even if you have fantastic hardware, you know, and numerous, you know, kind of resources, if you don't have good software to make use of it, you know, it's just no good for you. And right. the question is, you know, uh, it takes quite a bit of work for you to massage a model to make the most out of a hardware uh, target, right? And it doesn't mean that all oh, hardware targets will be appropriate for all models, but uh, by and large, it's dependent on very fairly low level, sophisticated engineering required to get there. So, and that's what we are all about automating at OctoML. Um, so you, uh, you have me curious, and I'm I'm going to ask you to go down the rabbit hole right away. <laughs> How do you possibly, at a code level through software, tune models on the fly based on hardware? This is like. My, yeah. I'm lighting up at the idea of like, the, get as technical as you need to, uh, because I would love for folks to really get a sense of yeah. where this challenge is being solved. Great, cool, absolutely. So let me just uh, start once upon a time. No, I'm not going to be that long. No, but <laughs> let me start. <laughs> well, you know, fundamentally, uh, machine learning models by and large are a sequence of linear algebra operations. Think of it as you're multiplying a multidimensional data structure, but not a matrix. Think of it as uh, uh, you know, a matrix, matrix vector multiplication, matrix matrix multiplication, but sometimes more than two dimensions would be, imagine a three-dimensional uh, matrix called a tensor, right? So uh, in general, like a generalization of that, a tensor by another tensor, it's really a lot of um, operation, linear algebra operations, right? So now, um, these are very performance sensitive because they depend on how you lay out the data structures in memory because it affects your memory hierarchy and your cache behavior. That depends which instructions you're gonna use in your processor because different processors or GPUs, they have different instructions that are more appropriate than others. Like instead of doing a scalar where you multiply one number by a single other number, you could use a vector instruction which multiplies two vectors at a time. And there's so many ways, there's literally millions, potentially billions of ways of compiling the same program into the same hardware but among these billions of possibilities, some of them are vastly faster than others. So what you have to do is just search, right? So given a program, 
that's your, your ML model and given the harder target and there are billions of ways in which you can compile those, how do you pick the fastest one? Okay, so now to answer your question directly, how do we use ML for that search? Well, the brute force way, and let's say the less smart way of doing this would be to try all, 10, all billions of possibilities. But the problem there is that you don't have time. Imagine making a variant of the code, compiling, running it, even just that, even if it takes a second each, you're talking about centuries of compute to actually, you talk about centuries worth of time to actually right. find what's the best program. Where ML comes into play is that as part of how TVM operates, TVM starts up when you create a new harder target, it runs a bunch of little experiments that builds a machine learning model of how the hardware itself behaves. So this machine learning model is then used to do a very fast search among all the possibilities in which you are uh, going to compile your model's harder target, among all of those possibilities, which one is likely to be the fastest one? Okay, and that can be vastly faster. Think of it a hundred million times faster than trying each one of them. So now you enable this ability of navigating the space of configurations and ways in which you can optimize the model uh, and then choose the best one. Okay, so now a machine learning model has a combination of these. So we just apply this subsequently of every layer of a model and then we compose them and see how they compose and run it through the prediction. And then in the end, we validate like, are we doing a good job? And the way we do that is by doing the full compilation and running a performance test and comparing, are we doing better? Yes, and we keep the search going. Does that, does that give you a general idea of how no, we it, do that? Yeah, It does, and, and this is the, it's the interesting challenge that we have with anything that's a, any long running process, even if like, just think of just traditional batch computing where, where mm -hmm. folks live a massive long batch. And at some point you're, you know, let's just, you know, for folks to remember the days of the overnight jobs, right? So they'd have some four hour batch that would run and you're five hours in and something's wrong. And there's the difficulty of assessing if I stop now, optimize, you know, correct code, do something and then rerun, is it more worthwhile to do so versus just letting it run out and it's going to take twice as long as I expected? Like that's a relative number that I think a lot of folks would remember, even if it's like a five minute script, if it takes five minutes and I, it should take 30 seconds, you know, makes yeah. sense. But like the, the scale at which you're talking about, number one, to the initial problem of like where we're going to go and uh, use a model against a mass data set, it's going to take potentially hours, days, whatever it's going to be. Yeah. It's significant. But then to run scenario, run that scenario repeatedly before triggering it effectively to find the most optimal place in which to host exactly. it is, uh, and <laughs> yeah, that's effective, and that's effective blown, what right? we do, right? <laughs> um, yeah, because so you, thank you. Because that's, running yeah. those, so running, running parallel simulation modeling, this is, you, anybody would think like, oh, of course, well, you're going to use machine learning. Like, well, you've now got an inception problem, right? Your effect, you have to do something that's incredibly complex to solve an even more complex problem. But it seems untenable for people to imagine that they could, this could be done. So this is why yeah, I asked and the this how, is what, this is like. Yeah, it is how we do it, that we use these machine learning models to make this. So now we actually, let me, let me go and answer a question you asked earlier, like what do we offer as a company? What is, what is right, a commercial yeah, yeah. story here, right? So anyone, TVM is open source, right? Anyone can just go to, um, you know, Apache TVM, GitHub repo, download the code and run it. But TVM takes, you know why it's set it up because you have to set up hardware targets and then you have to collect these machine learning models that predicts how the hardware behaves and uh and you know it is a sophisticated tool that you know it works really well but you do it does it does require quite a bit of uh lifting to to get going in the context of uh, of an end user right what we did at octoml is built a platform called the optimizer which is a fully hosted software as a service offering of tvm that automates the whole thing that has a really nice graphical user interface where you can upload models, choose your harder targets, uh, click the magic button, optimize, and then you know a few hours or maybe a day later, you get an, an executable just deeply optimized for your, your harder target of choice. Um, and the way that this is different than the experience using TVM, as I said, it's much easier. You don't have to install and do anything. There's no, no code required. You, know, you just literally upload the model, choose your target and download it, or you can use an API. But also, um, the optimizer has um, 
the models and has pre a preset set of these hardware target optimizers uh, built on machine learning that are ready to go for your use. So you don't have to go and, and collect yourself. Just right. really, we, you can be productive from day zero on using the optimizer. Well, this is what I think is incredible. And and I spoke with somebody very recently, and we had we just. We're just, you're, I'm enthralled with this idea of where we are today. And, you know, now we're 2021 as we record this. It's like the accessibility of both models and training data to like, if you wanted to try and get into the business of machine learning, just even to dabble with it, the, the, to get the hardware, to be able to have some data, to be able to, the, like the one-on-one layer of machine learning was very low level, like very simplified. And there was mm-hmm. no access to go beyond and really test it. So now, because like what you've got with the optimizer, like I said, you're shipping stuff that's there and it's ready to go. So you don't even need to then worry. Like, so like those first steps are incredibly challenging. And, and this is what I want to impress upon people that there's effectively no reason why you wouldn't just get started because it's been done for you and it's accessible to you now. Like it's, yeah. it's a wondrous time where we can do these things. Because for all of the things that people are worried about, you know, one, I don't understand complex mathematics. So how can I deal with machine learning? Well, it's not necessarily. Not new, necessarily, new, exactly. That, it's about abstracting those away, right? Yeah. Right. And secondarily, how do I know, how do I learn to trust what machine learning does, the only way to do it is to get in and see it. It's a weird, because yeah. machine learning has this really odd thing, even when we talk about AI sometimes, it's, uh, I describe it as like the scene from the matrix when, you know, when when uh, the Oracle system, you know, don't worry about the vase. And then he, he mm-hmm. says, what? And he turns around, and he knocks a vase off the table. And she says, what will really bake your noodle is if you had actually would have done that if I hadn't told you about it. And uh-huh. when we explain machine learning and like what you get, like you said, how do you find a picture of a cat? How do you tell the difference between a blueberry muffin and a Pomeranian? Like there's all of these things where there's people don't trust the outcome because they saw a meme about it one day, uh-huh. but you can dive in, you can test it out. You can put data through it. You can see right. the outputs. It's, it's there today because of what you and the team and what, what the community is doing around this stuff, which is pretty amazing. Right, yeah. Uh, and I wanna I want pull on that thread for just a minute on how do you trust machine learning models, which you know, there's, there's a whole you know, subfield of machine learning, which is about explainable AI or explainable right. machine learning models to get people to trust them more. But I would even start by saying that, how do we trust software today? Let's forget about machine learning. Let's just think about software. The way we trust it by saying, like you've, you've put this much time testing it and you will have some confidence that you know it's likely to work on the scenarios where your users care about. We do not do formal verification of all software today. You don't you don't formally verify Excel or Oracle or Microsoft SQL or MySQL. You just you te- you test it uh, extensively and then you have confidence that it behaves the way you expect it to behave and then you put a check mark and then you ship it. Machine learning models today are um, that way too. You have a training set and you have a test set. You train it, you test, and then you can do all sorts of uh, ways of actually getting more assurance in the test, but you know that it's going to work within the set of inputs that it was you know, uh, certified for, tested for. It works well, right? So um, yes, and then you can go all into, you know, to, there's a huge fun discussion that we could have at some point, probably not now, on how you explain to humans, what is it that a machine learning model is doing such that humans will, tr- will trust them better, right? right. So, um, and yeah, so and that might involve compromising performance. It could be, you might wanna choose a model that's not just as fast, but at least when you look at it internally, it works, uh, you, you, you can explain to a human. That might be useful for say medical diagnostics where you, you want a doctor to see like, you know, this kind of like generally looks right to the decision tree here is, right? right? So, and then we can help with those cases too with, in, in TVM and the optimizer because if you choose to use a model that's not as fast just because it's more potentially trustworthy, we can help you recoup performance by giving you a highly optimized version. And this is where, you know, so I would say like the people that, realize the the difficulty that they're facing like to get like how do we get better at machine learning you brought up the most perfect point we don't we just broadly trust software as if it's like if it's yeah. linear in its ability to scale we we're like ah i can almost run as fast as the machine so they've we've just 
it kind of, we grew up with it. So we don't distrust it as much as we, we don't necessarily trust it, but we don't distrust it. Machine right. learning and, and quantum and, and the idea of being able to scale far beyond human capability. There's this really odd case where the distrust is greater than the trust. Mm -hmm. Even though there's yeah. no fun. I mean, this is a, a, I mean, effectively it's a lot of the core and the fundamentals of like behavioral psychology, you know, yeah. because of the way that we, we place bets, the way we, we think about, you know, outcomes versus efforts. It is really funny or peculiar, I should say, you know, to see how people behave, but yet when they see the outcomes, like you said, they'd be like, Oh, okay. Uh, now that's fine. I, I, I make sense. Mm -hmm. But when you go one step further, which is especially the folks that are going to be, you know, customers and, and folks that you're talking to, they're further along where they know the risk of, you know, yeah. And the benefits outweigh. Yeah. So they, but the benefits still outweighs, yeah. but the benefits outweigh the risk, right? Exactly. And also, um, I mean, it, it trust the kind of stuff that it's, uh, I guess it's a kind of property kind of feeling that it takes a while to build, but it's very easy to lose, right? So it takes right. a lot of work to build trust and it's easy to lose. That means that uh, in machine learning, yeah, you can live with it for a while and it works really well, but then you make a small change because models evolve fast and then that one breaks and it makes you lose some trust in it. But, you know, that's just part of how it is. And I feel like given the strides made in, uh, machine learning research in getting models to be more trustworthy, more explainable together with all the um, machine learning systems work, which is what we focus on and making these models perform and run well in the real world. I feel like very, very quickly we're going we're gonna to trust them just as much as we trust software and, you know, with uh, things that are really transformational to our lives, like uh, self-driving cars, like automated diagnostics, like, you know, using AI designs, uh, drugs and therapies and, and right. diagnostics and so on. Like it's just, these things are so transformational for us that the, the progress that and the impact it has in human life is so far beyond the risks that it can cause, in my opinion, you know, this might be philosophical, but I do think that, uh, in this case, the benefits far outweighs the risks. So. I'd be curious, especially because you're obviously very close to it and you're, you, you were, you're doing this in academia as well as in business. So you're really tackling it on two streams, which is always amazing. And I think that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. But in fact, a lot of technology, amazing technology startups have been founded from academia and made their way into a commercial business. And then those folks maybe get into venture capital and it's neat to see this progression. But, you know, there are very few people that most people know, and I, whatever the descriptor is of most or, or, or many, but who they could look to and, and get that first understanding of the impact and importance mm -hmm. of machine learning on society. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, one that I know off the top of head, of course, Cassie Kozrakov, uh, she's with Google and, you know, a fantastic person mm -hmm. that truly does a lot to sort of share the human side of, of the value of machine learning. And, you know, it's neat to see those stories. So I'm curious, Luis, you know, who in your peer group and yourself included, like, how do you, how do you get people involved and interested in the potential that we have as a society because of, you know, machine learning? Yeah, great. Uh, great question. The way I think we get people interested and, and excited about it is just by con continue to show, the kind of problems that we can solve, the kind of uh, new applications that we can build with with machine learning, right? So uh, let me let me take a recent example. Seeing all of the progress going on on these large language models based on BERT or GPT three, for example, I mean the ability right, yeah, yeah. the ability of summarizing text is fantastic. The ability of generating new text is great to help you draft emails. These technologies just seem like magic, and they work really really well. And I and I think that has uh, the potential. Uh, to amplify ability to understand large bodies of tasks uh, of texts, right? So, for example, some of my uh, colleagues and friends at uh, AI2 uh, here in Seattle have been working on um, on these um, tools that help one understand whole bodies of knowledge in a specific field. They've done this for COVID recently, for example. I think it's just really amazing applications that can capture the imagination and have a direct impact right now that really gets people more excited about it. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. No, but that's, I, have, I, that's a great I, I think example. it's all about showing great, great, and then, you know, just uh, seeing the, so that that's one of them. The, the other one seeing the, I know that we're still far away from fully autonomous vehicles, but just seeing the kind of things that, uh, you know, um, 
ever more accessible electric vehicles from big ones, like for example, Tesla, seeing that a Model, a model 3 can do real-time computer vision and build a 3D model of the world around it. And you see right. it, you know, the cars and people crossing the streets and then, you know, like, and so this thing that is happening in real time, it's like, oh, this is a model how the car is seen. It's actually agreed with what I am. Just as you get exposed to this, you get people more and more on board and realize how, ex how exciting this is. So things all about the applications that it enables. And then a final one, um, it's more, you know, academic, but it's becoming more top of mind today that I find particularly exciting and happens to be related to one of my uh, personal intellectual passions of, you know, um, of molecular biology and, and life sciences. I, I think that um, nature uh, is, is a boundless source of two things, you know, mechanisms that we can use, mo molecules that it can go and use to do interesting things. And then second uh, is a boundless source of interesting um, problems that you can use AI uh, and ML to understand, you know, how nature works. And that has tremendous impact on, um, on understanding life and on understanding disease and understanding new therapies and so on. Uh, and there's some things I think it's fair to say that the strides that we've made in understanding, you know, uh, gene regulatory networks and understanding, you know, a lot of life sciences processes would not have been possible without uh, machine learning. Yeah, and right. And so, and these really, are yeah. So, and this has an incredible effect today. Like you know, how we can design a vaccine super fast. How we can actually test it super fast. How we can actually understand and do DNA sequencing uh, of 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 different people and understanding what what is it? How do they correlate with things that are being observed? I mean, this all boils down to uh, and is enabled by computational processes largely based on machine learning. Well, it, and that's one of the most, you know, I, I don't have the numbers handy, but I, I, you know, I know it's a good example to use about as far as the, 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 the economies that we've achieved of time and scale is, you know, look at sequencing DNA, both the physical exertion required to do so on like hardware, the time mm -hmm. and the cost in, you know, 20 years time or 10 years time, even what it doesn't take long to go back and see it was thousands of dollars in order to, well, and, and, you know, the amount of time required to do so versus now it is pennies on the dollar in effect relative to what the cost was not too many years ago. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I should mention as one of the, one of the research areas that I'm still uh, active um, is uh, on essentially using DNA for data storage, which, which involves you know writing DNA and reading DNA with sequencing, and this right. uh, relied on on the progress of DNA. Uh, so I watched these trends very closely. And just to put numbers there, we're really talking about you know the first human genome that was sequenced. It was a huge land, landmark a couple of decades ago. Literally cost over a billion dollars. Wow. And today you can do a full uh, you can do a full genome sequencing of you know under a thousand dollars, which is just we're talking about a million fold, literally a million fold in, uh, decrease, a million X decrease in cost. And then the amount, of, and this is all, by the way, enabled uh, not only by, you know, better understanding how, you know, it's of course, it's a genius idea of, you know, next generation sequencing. But from there to today, a lot of it um, is really advances in com computing infrastructure because it's com very computationally intensive, advanced in imaging technologies and optics. Right, so and advances in, in machine learning and decoding very faint signals into what are the letters that are in the DNA sequence. It's just a, yeah, um, um, all wrote on the backs of Moore's law plus, you know, computing. That's progress. right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to see as we come through, like there's a beautiful sort of readiness that's arrived of all of these criteria, right? Like you said, the you know, computational power, <clears throat> the understand scientific understanding, all of these things they they move in a in an effectively like a horse race beside each other, and when one crosses the line, the rest cross very shortly after because mm -hmm. one effectively carries the other and there is this merger of things that has to occur to get then from there exponential increase in capabilities. And we've mm -hmm. seen so much recently. And we as humans, we far overuse the phrase exponential, right? People are like, oh, it's yeah, exponential. It's just... <laughs> right? like, oh, and there's a literally, I, talk, uh, uh, I talked with uh, Joe Bakhti, he's the head of, uh, founder of a company called Quant Gene. And uh -huh. And he talked, we talked a lot about that. And that's, but that's their whole thing is using quantum computing and genome sequencing to find better ways to detect 
every kind of cancer. He says, but 10, 20 years ago, you would have a team of scientists, an entire research area that's focused solely on researching one type, mapping one type of cancer. Yeah. And now because of the ability in quantum computing, the ability we have in hardware, software, and people and understanding, they can seek every possible type of cancer collectively through the research they're doing. And this is really like first principles, like this is exponential growth in what we can do as an outcome because mm -hmm. of the technology that we've enabled. So what you've yeah. done and what you and the industry and the, the your peer group and all of us are, you know, they're doing is using first principles to do, to set the stage for an unlimited amount of new first principles thinkers yeah, to do fantastic mm -hmm. things. Yeah, no, great, uh, great point. And uh, the way I would, I would tie this conversation back to what Octa Mounted VM does is there are a lot of, you know, uh, problems today or opportunities today, specifically in life sciences, for example, if you're doing deep learning over genomic data that, you know, it'll be, be without significant optimization, it'll be beyond the reach of most people. We're talking about problems that could literally take millions of dollars worth of compute cycles in uh, in um, in, in cloud services, if you could, do, if you make that 50x faster, that a problem that takes millions of dollars could cost, you know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of dollars, which is something that now becomes feasible. And there's also something that, you know, we're very excited about this, you know, uh, what we're doing is because not only we make it more accessible to, you know, enable applications that we're already doing today and, you know, make them faster, more responsive, but also the kind of optimization degree that we offer could enable things that would be beyond the reach of many today in application areas that are more custom. Like for example, a lot of life sciences when I think it's one, one great example. So. Yeah. And I think this is the fantastic opportunity that you have got now for your, you know, current and future customers is that, it's no longer about baseline achievement, but we can immediately begin to think of optimization versus that wasn't accessible before. That just wasn't, mm -hmm. it was just a matter of, can we do it? And now it's, can we do this? And are we doing it in the most effective and optimized manner? Right. Yeah. And, and which, which is often uh, necessary, like, so to actually m make it possible, let me, let me give you a, without disclosing anything sensitive, you know, we've been, we've been working with customers that both deploy uh, AI, ML at scale on the edge and in the cloud. On the edge side, think of it as if you had uh, a machine learning model that helps you that helps you extract, feet, help you understand the scene such that you can replace objects in real time, say for video chat, for example. And then you have a you, you have that app running all sorts of ends uh, and devices like you know different types of laptops, PCs, or tablets, or phones, and so on. Once you have a model like that, what you have to do. Um, what you have to do today to deploy it is by every single time you have to go and optimize and make sure that this is run fast enough on this end uh, on on this PC and then in that different model in that tablet like you know it's just really like unsurmountable model but now automating all of that you know which is what we do in the optimizer is something that um, is enabling uh, you know the evolution of these applications and on the cloud side you know if you're doing things like you know computer vision over large collections of 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 uh, images or or video. And you know, through a large scale, so this could cost uh, you know an incredible amount of money if you don't optimize, right? So it means that you, until you hit a certain cost target, you can't uh, you can't really deploy. Even for companies that have deep pockets, it's so significant what we're talking about here. So, well, and it becomes the interesting conundrum of in order to test to see that your your model is effective and how long it's going to take to run and what the optimization opportunities may be for it you run it against your data set. But then if you run it repeatedly against the same data set, it actually goes counter to the value. Like in fact, it's, it's dangerous if you continue to run, like you're not gonna get expected results and it may sort of skew some results if you send exactly the same data through exactly the same model over and over again. Well, then you should run it again, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, then, yeah, but it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a weird, yeah. so, so that's why effectively people are probably gonna just sort of throw up their hands and say, hey, you know, it's it, at least it's, it's we know it works. We don't know that it could run faster. So there was in sort of an unfortunate acceptance up until, you know, what you're bringing to the market that there just was, it was just the cost of doing business in right. ML, right? And and that doesn't need to be the case anymore. Doesn't need to be, the, exactly. It doesn't need to be the case. And uh, these tools, 
it, well, and it doesn't need to be the case for as many possible users as, poss as, as we possibly can. That's why we strive for really easy to use and really level, you know, making the level abstraction much higher. So instead of you having to pair a uh, super talented software engineer with a data scientist to go and do these things, we're gonna be able to have the data scientists themselves to just go and use a tool that subsumes the need of having to work closely with a software engineering team to deploy it, right? right. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, and I, yeah. so this is the thing of we can now actually get positive business and societal mm -hmm. outcomes instead of just technological outcomes, right? I, I think right. one of my favorite things I, I remember from Peter Thiel, he refers to, he says, we've, we were trying to get Star Trek, but all we got was the Star Trek computer. We right. didn't get the tricoder. We didn't get the trans. It, like we didn't get the other things. All we got was the the computer that you know, and and in fact, that's the dangerous place to rely on. You know, we need to do things with these things, and this is why right. we are now at the point where we can really do amazing things. Absolutely, yeah. Especially as a data scientist, right? So I, I'm actually curious, Luis, yeah. what is a data scientist? Because I I sort of get different pictures of what that person is today. So if I'm a, an organization and I'm looking to hire a data scientist, what's that profile of a person look like? I'm curious in your experiences, given that you are obviously very well, close to the field. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Well, so the, it, it's a great question. It's, uh, and, but there's just so many possibilities here, right? So I would say it really, it really depends on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. Often data scientists uh, tend to specialize in different kinds of data. Right, so different kinds of models. I would say that the way you should approach are, you know, see what kind of data you have, what kind of problems you're trying to solve, and go after data scientists had general domain experience. Because if you have some domain experience, you tend to get a lot better, you know, more predictive models and a lot better analysis out of the data that you that you have. What I think, um, and I should, I should focus on people. I would say that focus on people to understand the problem domain and understand right. the you know the core tools uh, in in machine learning and data analysis and, and data analytics and statistics, right? To go and and, and work with your data. Now um, to go full circle. Now what I think is harder is trying to find a data scientist that can do that and also can do all of the complicated, ugly software uh, tricks and engineering that you have to do to actually right. get get the model to, or get the results to be usable as an end product. This is almost impossible to find somebody like that. This is why, you know, when we do customer, early on in the, the life of the company, we're doing customer interviews to see what is it that we will be uh, going after. The number one pain points that we heard from uh, folks that were running these things was that, well, you know, we have great data scientists and we've been doing better because the tools for data scientists are getting better and, you know, and there's more uh, people, but now we have to go and pair them with, with very rare software engineering skills. And that's what breaks the whole magic there because now you have the data, you have the data scientists, you just don't have the rest of the resources to go and make their output be useful. Um, that's where um, that's where we started like, okay, let's just go and zero in on, let's automate the process of what gets out of the hands of data scientists and what should be the deployable module and get that gap uh, and cover that with, you know, very sophisticated automation that uses machine learning. That's really what the optimizer does, right? So, and first of all, uh, my favorite name on earth of a platform optimizer. Sounds cool. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like it. We love it. Yeah, the optimizer is definitely, <laughs> yeah, every time I, I say like, it makes me smile. And I've been saying this for over a year now. And so I love, thank you. Thank you for that, Eric. So uh, I hope I answered your question, but yeah, so the, Hiring data scientists is, is um, I'm glad that the tools are getting better, but it's just so dependent on what kind of problem you want to solve that, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really about people to understand the problem domain, so. It, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see, because I, I think what we face right now as, as society and businesses and, and government mm -hmm. is the sense that you've got to wait for the next, we have to wait for the next batch of students to come up through the education system with access yeah. to the tools. So you have an eight, you know, to 10 year cycle before people are actually able to do. And in, and in that amount of time, things will have so fundamentally changed. Whereas now we don't oh, have yeah. to wait for that. We can, we can train people in place. We can up level people where they're at through software, through technology, through capabilities. <laughs> and it's, 
uh, you know. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I guess I'm I'm not sure if that's where you're going. I'm sorry if there's like complete uh, tangent here, but I think it's fascinating to think about the role of AI, ML, and machine learning to actually in educating humans, right? So, right. <laughs> right. So there's like ways of using AI, ML to generate problem sets for kids to learn. There are ways of evaluating them, like using yeah. So, and using that to actually train engineers too, right? So, the yeah. the potential for this stuff is just. <clears throat> It is wondrous, you know. Uh, there's obviously there's, and I've talked with a few folks about some of the challenges around the ethics and and, and biases in AI, and, and, and I mean, that's uh, definitely a thorny one. It's super a tough important, one. extremely important, and tough one, yeah. I, I and I'll I'll ask you this kind of in your, I'll, let me lean on your academia side because I, I I especially mm -hmm. as you put my up, professor hat, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll put my professor hat, yeah. <laughs> you're you're very you probably, that's probably a, an area that where it gets dealt with or questioned the most is that through academia, we're studying, you know, what are the potential, like in business, it's more like, how do you, you know, broadly Good. get this out mm -hmm. to the world? Uh, but we are finding through, you know, through thinking groups and through, you know, think tanks and through universities and the academia, like we are now at the study phase and or continue to be when will be for a long time in the study phase of how do we make sure that, we are as best as possible using these tools and this data. You know, it, it's a real conundrum because if it if it's a representation of society, how much do we steer it in order to get what we hope to get out of it versus if a machine learning model gives you an output and we should, there's a reason it came up with that output. We may not trust it or right. understand it or maybe not like it, but, it's more like looking at how it got there than trying to, you know, stand at the output phase and then try and steer it towards a, a belief or an opinion, which is. Uh, yeah. Well, this, this is a great question. Super deep. And again, it could be a topic of a long conversation, <laughs> I know, uh, right. but, but uh, I would say that, no, quick, right? <laughs> no, no, just no, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to offer some, some thoughts here because I do have colleagues and friends that uh, think about this for a good chunk of their uh, waking hours. So, First of all, I mean, absolutely, we have to be mindful of biases in uh, in machine learning, um, especially because machine learning being dependent on on training data. Uh, we need to make sure that the data is representative of this broad set of users possible that's actually equitable across all of the stakeholders and how this model is deployed. Then there's aspects of the model architecture that should be trained and should be developed in the loop, assuming. And I think that comes fundamentally from having a diverse team. Right, so if you have a diverse team of people that are working on this, a diverse engineering team or a diverse team of of, of uh, data scientists, a diverse team that are actually building this, naturally will point out deficiencies in training data and in the architecture of the model. So let's just start with that. There's a people aspect here that even though we talk about machines doing more and more things, you have machine, you have people designing machines and designing engines, and these people themselves right. need to be diverse. That's why I'm a firm believer of uh, extremely diverse things. You know, I've done that. In, in academic teams that I've uh, that I've built and you know pay a, a lot of attention to that um, at OctoML as well. That's one thing. And then the second thing is just through education, right? So we have to keep bringing up you know these aspects of uh, of uh, of bias and make sure that it works for all the stakeholders, not just in machine learning, by the way, but in any engineering discipline. So there's a friend of mine that once gave a talk. I don't want to put his name here, but um, so about bias in machine learning. And he started with a great example that you might have heard that one of the very first uh, photographic films, have you heard that story before? Photographic oh, films of Kodak that essentially, I mean, talking about the chemical engineering thing, like you design the chemistry of, of models and the way they design, you know, the photosensitive material, they realized that the way they were judging whether it was good or not was by, you know, um, checking this against a certain set of people with a different skin color, with a specific right. skin color. That means that if you actually use this in uh, uh, other skin colors, it would just not work at all, it would just not look right. And that was the case. So that means that they were ex they were biased. That's a great example that bias in how you evaluate whether something is ready or not for all the stakeholders is just not applied to machine learning, but any engineering discipline. In this case, I thought it was a really great one because you're talking about something that's, you know, on the order of a century old, right? right? So, and it's just, and then the, the way the tone of the film wasn't good for all, all skin colors and it actually showed, uh, you know, as, as one historical aspect of that. And that's, that's true, you know, how you design, you know, how this affects building architecture. There's like 
a lot of things that humans use should have this thinking, not just machine learning, right? It's just that machine learning gets that, you know, extra aspect because right now it's enabling applications that actually not extra, machine learning gets extra attention on this because of how their applications is changing our lives super fast today. Right. But also because it's so sensitive to data and the iteration is so fast that, you know, uh, leads to um, a lot of misfortunes and, you know, uh, let's say missed opportunities to make it better early on. It, and it's, there's so much positive, but unfortunately what will happen is the, the one, the one negative story will be the one that becomes the focus yeah, quite often. Right. It's like it with anything. It was interesting. I, I was at a, uh, uh, an event a couple of years ago. God, it's, it's that it's almost feel like it's been that long since yeah. we've been at in-person events. Um, and it was a, a Canadian insurance company that had created their own uh, their own call center th with AI, machine learning, all this stuff. And they uh -huh. basically fed it every single call that they've ever had taken with a customer service call and and trains this. And then they finally like this was the moment where they set it as the to answer the next call. And it took the call mm -hmm. and it dealt with with the person. And they said it goes all the way through and like, they're obviously they're listening and monitoring, like what's let's, let's see how it behaves. And it gets all the way to the end, solves the person's problem in a perfect human sounding voice and gets all the way to the end. And, the, and just as they're closing up the call, then the machine says, is there anything else that I can help you with today? And they said, yes, they, wow. they stopped and looked at each other. They're like, we that's never been in a training manual it's never been in, there's nothing that tells it to do that but through all of the different calls and all the different it ascertains that this was the best way and they said then the, what was even funnier was the response the person says no thank you but i just want to thank you especially because it's so nice to talk to a human for a change right <laughs> <laughs> i love that yeah yeah that's really and, fantastic but this is the there, there's going to be a beautiful, I'll call it like an augmented world where we can leverage machine learning and these capabilities with like natural language processing and all these different things. We can use that like I hear about companies that are using it to detect, uh, you know, emotional changes in people's voices and they're using effect to detect changes in their behaviors that, you know, could be for people that are at risk of suicide or there's, you know, so there's so many incredibly positive things. And this is why, like I said, when, uh, so we have a, a friend in common, uh, Amber Roland, who uh, mm -hmm. is, you know, you know, through your, you, she helps you with your, your PR and, yeah. and, and Amber's such a fantastic human and she's done a ton of stuff, you know, introduced me to a ton of great people as well over time. And she's like, every time I talk to her, it's just like this, like, oh yeah, here's the human side. And she's going to introduce me to people that are doing big things. And mm -hmm. when she said, I want you to talk to these folks at OctoML, I had to race to the reply and say, yes, <laughs> I'm so glad that you did. Yeah. <laughs> Now, yeah, cool. I, I know, of course, because like you mentioned, it's a tough, this is the tough part. It's hard to have hero customer stories because a lot of the customers you have, obviously there's going to be sensitivity and there's, and you're early right. uh -huh. in, you know, in the, in the mm -hmm. birth of the company, but you know, what is maybe uh, another quick example of a real human outcome that you've been able to see come to life? Well, yeah, no, uh, great. So that we have, um, but the, the several of them, right? So um, we, so let me, let me, in fact, let me just back up into like what kind of customers we work with today, right? So we have two categories of customers. One are machine learning end users. These are companies that deploy, that have products that use machine learning, both in the edge and, and in the cloud without getting into uh, uh, real specifics. I think of it as enabling much more natural user interfaces. I'd say that this is, has, you know, a human outcome because if you actually enable a new way of using voice-based interfaces and, in very cheap, low, uh, low end devices, you can embed them into more, uh, more usage scenarios and therefore 
have uh, both add, added convenience to people that are able and also added abilities to people that do not have, you know, that, that are potentially disabled, right? So uh, I'd say that this is like a really nice uh, outcome, just enabling more intelligence, intelligence in the edge is something that we have customers that we have been able to do so. But anyway, so the two types of customers are just machine learning and users, and then also um, enabling hardware vendors that do not, did not have a solid software stack to make their hardware useful for machine learning and enable them uh, to, to, to do so. Um, but I'd say that in general, like the impact on, on human life of what we do is again, one enabling applications that weren't possible before in terms of intelligence in the edge and also enabling these large scale compute problems that could be related to say life sciences, you know, um, uh, that would not be accessible without the level of optimizations that, that we provide. So that's how we get really proud of what we do in terms of the end, you know, uh, end impact in human life is really enabling new applications and, and enabling things that weren't possible before. So, well, the the thing that I <clears throat> I try to remind people too is, you know, when we look at phases of of adoption and and real, like if we look at sort of the hype life cycle of so many things and. We talk about edge computing for a long time and people still yeah. sort of struggle with what it means. But in effect, the, the, the phone, you know, in a way, the phone you hold in your hand, while it is a computer that's stronger than the th computer that sent the first humans to the moon, mm -hmm. it is in effect an edge device. Edge devices aren't just Raspberry Pis that are glued to the side of a cell phone tower. They're going to be computing that are distributed with different physical yeah. capabilities, different memory, different storage, different network, different, you know, CPU. And this is when the ability to use decentralization, it will, this is the, again, exponential effect is that we can, rather than taking, collecting the data there, stream it back to central storage, processing it centrally, streaming it back, the amount of bandwidth, it's it's untenable, right? And this is why being able to do processing and machine learning at the edge is an yeah. amazing leap in, in what we need to do. And this is what hammers home the value of what you're doing because mm -hmm. there is no way that the model you're going to run centrally we're, is going to be run the same way at the edge Absolutely. The hardware is different. Everything. Yeah. yeah. So I love, yeah, you said it exactly right. And I'll just add one more potentially overly dramatic point here that, which is speed of light is limited and it's, light is fast, but you cannot make it faster. You know, if you had to actually have to go, um, and you know, it, it speed of light is a limitation in in wireless com in, in any communication, right? So not to just wireless in any any communication. So that means that some things fundamentally you have to do at a very short physical distance to actually to enable low latency and not having to rely on long you know long range infrastructure. There's all of the hoops that he has to jump. So being able to compute on the edge has this fundamental enabling, like backed by you know hard uh, laws of physics that you must run this locally, otherwise you can have this application, right? So yeah. It also just it enables yeah. low power uh, art, low, like right Be architectures. Yeah. It, there's this is the reason why people hate Bitcoin, not just because of most of the people that got in early and got rich, was because of the physical impact it has on compute requirement. And so there's always this comparison of like, oh, you know, for every Bitcoin you mine, it will basically you could power a city for a year, whatever it's going to be. Yeah, just but this that is. That's a sort of a mythical historical thing. But beyond Bitcoin, when we look at, yeah, using blockchain, using machine learning, all of these things to be able to do them on lower power, diverse hardware platforms. Yeah. This is, this is the Gutenberg revolution of machine learning. Yeah. Wow, thank you. All right, that was beautiful. I think the good one. <laughs> Agreed, yeah. And also to free people from having to uh, even think about how they're going to deploy models because it's just so backwards. Like, imagine if, even as you're developing a model, knowing how you're going to be used, but how do you know? I mean, there's so many, just think about um, if you're going to deploy mobile phones, like, you know, there's literally 200 different Android phones. So how are you going to tune for every single one of That's them? Right. It's just like, this is a very small example. But now just think about, okay, models you're going to see could run on a phone, could run on a camera, could run on a smart ring, on a smart device, on a, on a smart watch and all of these things. It's just not having to worry about where it runs could enable a whole wave of innovation, right? So. This is uh, see. You must be excited 
to be able to be both, you know, in academia and watching this world yeah. evolve. And now mm -hmm. you can very literally create the future through what you're enabling at OctoML. This is how good does it feel when you <laughs> when you began this journey? It's it's got to be challenging. And I say this like obviously, there's no easy path to entrepreneurship. Uh, and yeah. I well, thank you. I, I uh, thanks for that question because I I'll, I'll use this opportunity to emphasize how lucky I feel to have the team that we have, um, and I think that has uh, one of the reasons that I think we have such a fantastic uh, team is because of our connection to academia and the fact that we are a company that has a bottom line to to hit. You know, we have investors, we have customers, we have employees, and luckily we're in a, we're in a very good position. Um, and uh, that means that we're not we're not a research group, right? But we have a lot of we're really pushing the pushing the the state of the art because we are a deep technology company, right? So we are enabled by the fact that we have people. Uh, what, what the products that we build are enabled by the fact that we actually have people that think on um, on the frontiers of what's possible with machine learning, like using machine learning to make machine learning better. And the connection to academia, I think, is is uh, really important and extremely synergistic, and I would say essential to us because we are connected to the latest and greatest in machine learning models and latest and greatest in understanding of where even the hardware uh, industry is going and what's possible um, there. Uh, but also as a source of talent, right? So uh, our right. company has uh, incredible, uh, in incredible, incredible talent. We have, you know, more than a dozen PhDs in the team, in the team of forty. Not that you know, uh, it's just about that. But I mean, everyone is great. But I'm just saying that just show the the level. Uh, that we are operating here in terms of pushing the state of the arts is that we have a lot of people that, you know, operate like software engineers and making a product, but they all uh, have a uh, research mentality and research background. And I always think about how is it that, how can I do something better than was done before? Because that's how a lot of folks have done research in life think, right? So that's, uh, and, and that's that'd be very fortunate. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's always that tough metric when you like, and, and I believe everyone should be proud, especially when you say like, you know, we have a number of PhDs at, at, at my own company. We sort of have the same thing we, we, we talk about it sometimes. But, and it feels odd sometimes to say it, depending on what the context. But the truth is what you just said is that there, there are a group of people who chose to go above and beyond in order to advance something that had been done before that could be done better. And then when you bring especially machine learning of all the technologies mm -hmm. and the things that we're doing in, in the world right now, this needs those advanced people, first right, for sure. thinkers who are willing to do what they did before and as a group, as a collective. And it's also important that you don't have one PhD because then uh, you, having multiple thinkers that way, people who've lived that life, they have the ability to use critical thinking as a group to aim for the best outcome, not the right answer, the best outcome. And yeah. as humans, especially in entre as entrepreneurs, we often get stuck with, I've got the right answer and I've just got to teach the world that versus let's as a group work with our customers and the community and the world and academia yeah. and come up with the, the best outcome because it will be surpassed in future. It, absolutely. No yeah. Answer. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I love that, that comment. And one thing I wanted to add there is, is that, you know, the path to impact and the time to impact a machine learning model uh, uh, in machine learning progress in general is extremely short in the grand scheme of things. You're talking about something that was in the academic world. People write papers about, you know, in January of a year could be by, you know, by by the end of that, by the mid of that same year, it could already be in production by people right. using it. Like just this kind of like unheard of, right? In terms of scientific disciplines, writing academic papers about and that having impact on people's lives and new products within months. We're not, we're not talking about years or decades, which is the typical thing that in a lot of disciplines, you think about advances in life sciences, by the time it has an impact in diagnostics or, or treatment, like it's just a long time, like the future, same thing in physics and in chemistry. So like in machine learning people write papers in January for something that's in production in, in March you know so like, right <laughs> so having this tight loop with the researchers and getting this thing going is really important right so and I think it's a beautiful opportunity like I love that people are coming because the, the dangerous thing is that if it only lives in academia and never makes it if the same people that 
build, you know, take the concepts to this next level, don't get a chance to actually be a part of the implementation of them. How do they, how do we learn, you know, other than waiting for the next academic to come along and evaluate and, and analyze. And like you said, in the past, it, it would be a decade uh, before you would see the results, you know, necessarily now that like you can literally in academia, work towards a goal, do, you know, yeah. achieve your plan, evaluate, take the hypothesis. And now you can actually enact that hypothesis and, and as a commercial business, I think this is really, really cool. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I completely agree. Could, couldn't agree more. So, so you yeah. one, before we close up, Luis, I'd love to hear your thought. Uh, 18 year old Luis Saze decided he was going to school. Number one, did you imagine you were going to go to school as long as you did? <laughs> when, when, when did you build your plan and when did that when did wow. when did today become part of that plan well wow, that's uh that's you, go, you give me the goosebumps here so <laughs> uh just a, a quick personal uh company here i grew up in brazil i went through engineering school in brazil when i was uh 18 i was an electrical engineering student uh university of sao paulo um you know at that time i've i definitely like I already liked research, was involved in some research, uh, but honestly never thought that first I'll become a professor, you know, just all, uh, and then even though I, I would say that I had thought about starting companies at that time, but never uh, uh, ended up not doing it because it was, I got into the academic uh, world and research and, you know, left uh, Brazil to go to IBM research, work on this machine that was involved in life science. And after that, I went to a PhD. So I was very, you know, taking the next, uh, the next opportunity. So when did that plan come together? Uh, I don't think there was, I don't think it was ever a point where the whole plan came together, it was all following, <laughs> the, following the flow. But I always had the North Star that what gets me up uh, in the morning is uh, intellectual excitement and working with people that I can learn from and admire. And, you know, academia is great for that. And at Octo ML, it's been great for that too, because, you know, it's been an entrepreneur's dream to have this kind of thing that we're able to build here. So I, uh, I hope that we find more Luis Sazes in this world. <laughs> you took kind, Eric. Thank you. Well, thank you for the conversation. This has been a lot of fun and I hope to chat with you again soon. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'll be excited to watch the growth of, of the team, the organization, your customer base, hear some of the stories. So we'll get caught up again in future. Uh, I'll obviously have links down in the show Great. notes for folks that want to find uh, where's if they, if folks want to contact you directly, Luis, uh, obviously they can go to OctoML. We can, we can Great. have that, but what's Great. they want to reach out to you uh, directly. What's the best way to do so? Yes. Yeah, so you can just uh, uh, reach out at Luis at OctoML.ai. L-U-I-S at actoml.ai. You reach out to me and I'll get back to you. Looking forward to hearing from your audience. So I, I also want to congratulate you and thank you for being a, an amazing intellectual who doesn't use their university address when they run a company. It's, it's, I, I know there's, there's a beautiful <laughs> pride in the stanford.edu or the University of Washington, yeah. whatever that, it's always amazing to see somebody who's like the, a three year CEO of a company and they still use their university email as their contact. I'm like, you you should be proud of everything and today <laughs> right. is a octo ml is the thing to be proud of everything you've got is I think it, something to be proud of but thank I, you I, yeah I, and i'm very very <laughs> proud of octo ml for sure yeah and this email address will be there hopefully octo ml will be there for a long time so this email address will be valid for a very very long time i'm very uh, proud of it so judging by you Great. and your team i i very firmly believe it will be so thank you very right. much for the time today Luis. thank you thank you again eric wow that was there's a lot of fun <laughs>